UCA proudly presents our quarantine project, Fortune Cookie Conversations, interviews and conversations exploring the unique Chinese American experience beyond fortune cookies. Hello, May here, here to talk with you about Chen Chen, who is a poet that I discovered when I was doing poetry out loud around this time of last year. To do that, you basically go on this website, I'm pretty sure it's poetryfoundation.org, you select a poem you like, make sure it fulfills the requirements your teacher gives you, and then you memorize it and you recite it in front of your entire class, and it's this whole competition process. But honestly, I was just doing it for extra credit, so when, when it came time to pick a poem, I was just trying to find something as quick as possible, so I just searched up random keywords. And one of them just happened to be tomato, and that led me to one of his poems, which was self-portrait at so much potential. And it was a lot more than tomatoes that he was talking about. But like in a really great way, like he mentions being gay and the struggle that comes with it. At first I was like shocked in like a really good way, because like you don't see any of that representation, and it's insane to think that like frozen is older than gay the legalization of gay marriage in America. And it's so important to get stuff like this out there. And I was just like, wow, it's really great how you can find a poem like this on a website that's used for school competitions. Which is great. And it's really great to see that progress. And it's only going to get better. So yeah, I was like, wow, this is a really great poem. I wonder who wrote it. So I went to the top and I saw by Chen Chen. And I was like, Chen Chen? That sounds like a Chinese name. So I clicked on the name and it brought me to his profile. And then there was picture of this Asian man. I was just like, oh, that's super cool. I didn't know Chinese Americans could become poets. Like we live in such a Eurocentric world. And like, I was looking at my bookcase the other day and then I realized that I don't have a single person of color writing any of the books on my bookshelf. And I have a pretty diverse selection. Like I have most of your young adult books, like Harry Potter and stuff, and are random ones that I bought at like the school fair or something. And I have your great classes. Like, you just don't see a lot of that in the writing world. And it's really dumb. And, like, you don't see a lot of, like, gay writers either. Or, like, gay stories. Or gay anything. Because we live in also, we also live in a really heteronormative society. Which is gross. And it should be fixed. And it is getting fixed. And it's really great to see that. And it's really great to see people like him who are brave enough to speak out about their experiences and share that with the world. Because it's so important to share these things. Like, I feel like even like the small things about your experience, that can mean a lot to someone. Even if it's something as small as like your favorite comfort food. And I've actually, I've put this first one in a poem because um, I love it so much. It just ha carries so many childhood memories for me. My mom would always make it, uh, Lido Tang. Um, so mung, mung bean soup, I think is the English. Um, it literally, literally translates to like green bean soup and that's because of like the color of the bean. Um, I would always have it sweetened. Um, my mom would usually add honey instead of sugar, a little healthier and uh, have it chilled. Um, and just perfect on um, summer days. And I just remember uh, when I uh, went back to China, um, I did study abroad there. And I was actually in another city, not where my uh, family is from, but I was in Hefei um, through my college. And there were all these great street food vendors. And uh, during the summertime, you know, it was really hot. And they would just serve this particular dish. And it just brought back all these memories for me. It's just food, right? It's literal tongue, but like, that means so much. <laughs> like that's like a staple in my growing up. Like I've always had it. It's always a staple breakfast food. I haven't had it in a while, but like it's a huge part of my childhood. And if I saw that in like sixth grade in a poem instead of whatever I was reading, I probably would have cried tears of happiness because I felt so outcasted at that time as like a Chinese kid in this white town where no one knows what Liro Tong is and it feels like you're the only person who eats that. Also, if I feel like if I brought that to lunch, like if I brought Liro Tang to my school cafeteria at lunch in sixth grade, someone probably asked if I was eating dog. Because, you know, haha, <laughs> dog eater jokes. Yay, so funny. So, yeah, if I saw Liro Tang getting mentioned in like a positive way and as someone's favorite comfort food and from someone who's also Chinese American like me, I just feel really great. Like, representation, that's like so important. Oh my gosh. Like, I don't know how it's explain it. It just makes people feel really great. I'm really bad with words, but Chin Chin isn't. He's like a poet. So he's not bad with words. You should check him out.
Speaking about how mentioning food in a poem is huge and how it means more than it appears, here is what he says. In the writing world, um, where I think yeah, non-Chinese, non-Asian uh, editors, teachers, other writers think that, or often think that I should be writing about my identity in a certain way in, I think, a simpler way, um, you know, what they assume, again, um, I should be producing what I should be creating because of my identity. You know, so for instance, um, I remember, where was I? I think I was in Illinois, and I read a poem at a school um, for this reading event, uh, this poem from my book that's called In the City, and it mentions dumplings, but that's not really what it's about <laughs> and it's not the only thing that it's about um you know and it is about immigration in certain ways but it's also thinking about like the narratives the expected narratives around um immigration and being you know a chinese immigrant family and all of that and i just remember this guy came up to me after the reading um this white guy <laughs> who was very like well-intentioned i he didn't mean any harm by it uh, but it was frustrating because he said, oh, I loved the poem about dumplings <laughs> and I'm going to go make some dumplings now with my Chinese friend. Uh, it's just so oversimplified, you know, his interpretation of my work. Um, you know, and there have been other instances like that where, yeah, very well-meaning people um, latch on to the element in the poem that feels more most familiar to them, you know, a safe thing to talk about. Like, oh, I'll just talk about the food <laughs> in the poem. Uh, when I'm like, oh, but I'm talking about, you know, like the tension between my parents and um, you know, these patriarchal elements of uh, Chinese culture and Chinese families um, and like the damage of that um, on my mother. Um, but also my parents' homophobia, um, but also us, you know, coming to this country together. Um, so it's all of those things. And so for someone to say like, oh, the poem about dumplings, <laughs> it's just so uh, reductive, you know, it really doesn't see the whole picture. So that's something that's frustrated me. I too have had experience where I try to speak out about it that have been oversimplified. And I see this a lot with like Asian American allies. Like they seem to only want to support and understand what they want to support and understand. So like when you tell them, hey, this actually isn't that great, they don't want to change. It's like so weird how like people don't know that fetishizing Asians isn't the same as supporting us and if anything is the complete opposite of support. Like, it's really interesting, like, you'll see someone, like an Asian American, speak about the struggles and like the comments are like, haha, yeah, it's kind of stupid, Asian culture is so cool, K-pop and anime is cool. And like, that's great, and I'm great they support that parts of our culture, but you have to look more into that. And you can't just look at that and then fetishize that and then place that mindset on real people. It is not a compliment when you call me your anime waifu, even though I'm a real person with real feelings who is much more than a 2D piece of drawing where you can project whatever weird feelings you have towards her. I am a real person. I do not feel safe or complimented or supported when you call me docile or submissive. That is weird. I feel like you're treating me like a pretty piece of jewelry when I am human with feelings. With the rise of BL, which is boys love, I've seen this on a worse scale with East Asian men, especially MLM Asian men. And MLM stands for man loving man. So that can be just any man who is attracted to the male gender. I remember seeing this really innocent video of these two guys being close. You know, that's fine, that's normal, it doesn't matter if they're dating or if it was platonic, that's fine, right? But then, but either way, you shouldn't be sexualizing that. But then, you go to like the comic section, and it was 
so bad. Like they're all making it sexual. They're like, aha, I've seen this before in VL. And like, here's the thing with VL. A lot of it's sexual. So when you say, aha, I've seen this before in VL, I know what's gonna happen next or something gross like that. You're basically saying, you can basically report VL with porn. Like the way they word it is very suggestive and that's gross. You just shouldn't sexualize people. And the thing is, some of these people are minors. Like I see comments like these on minors videos. And what makes me really sad is when I have to see people put in their bios that they're not dating. Like you can ruin a friendship like that by projecting that image onto someone, especially if they're not comfortable with it. In my opinion, being close and like physically close to someone is a part of Asian culture. Like you go to like, at least for me, when I go back to China, you see a lot of people that are close together, regardless of gender. And I think that's great. I think it's a great thing. And it's weird how in America, it's like, if you hug someone of the opposite gender, everyone thinks you're dating, which is stupid. So to have someone objectify something that's just part of your normal life and make it something that's uncomfortable for you by making it inherently sexual, that's just not good. Doesn't make you feel good. Eh. BL as a whole can be pretty problematic as well. A lot of it relies on the fetishization of MLM relationships, which is really sad and gross. And some of it is fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't be consuming MLM media. I actually think it's great. Like I said, representation is super important, but make sure you're doing it right. The closest thing I can compare it to is straight men that watch lesbian porn, and it's almost the same thing. <laughs> like a lot of your BL is really sexual and pretty graphic. And the thing is, a lot of these straight girls that consume MLM media think it as just something hot. They reduce it to something sexual and they only see it as something sexual. And that does not make you a LGBTQ ally. And what I've seen a lot is that people will say that BL is hot, but then they will look at G-Love, which is girls love, and they will call it that gross. Do you see where the problem is? Do not call yourself an ally if you're just a fetishizer. You're neither a Asian American ally or just an Asian ally in general, nor are you an LGBTQ ally when you fetishize both of those things. Please consume media properly. <laughs> Another thing that people seem to oversimplify or just straight up not get is how harmful stereotypes are. Some of those assumptions I just mentioned, uh like in the dating world, have created um, obstacles um, with uh, non-Chinese guys who would be interested in uh, dating me, but yeah, just had these really harmful assumptions in mind. Um, or non-Chinese guys having these assumptions and not wanting to um, date me. Not that people have to want to, <laughs> um, but that they just, wrote off an entire group of people based on their assumptions, based on my appearance, and you know, based on things that they've seen in the media. Um, so that's been, you know, a major obstacle. And I think coming to a place of greater self-acceptance has been a long journey, a journey that I'm still on. So in terms of my relationship to my own appearance and you know, my body image, I think that has been significantly damaged by um, primarily you know, white beauty standards um, and assumptions about, or just constructions of masculinity and you know, what that's supposed to look like in American society. I'm very feminine. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with a guy being like that. Um, and there are times when I feel and act, you know, more feminine than other times. Um, but I just don't like the assumption or the stereotyping that, you know, I'm automatically that thing. Um, and I find it really, um, like objectifying and othering. So yeah, that's something that I want to see more change with. 
A big part of this quarantine was just me having great awakenings as I stare at myself in the mirror as I give myself a private concert for my stuffed animals at 2 a.m. And I'm actually pretty hot. I was never ugly, I just grew up in a Eurocentric world where that was a beauty standard. And I let that get into me, and I let the harmful comments and like assumptions people make of me get me, and I start to believe in them. But then I realized as I sat in complete isolation for like almost a year, that none of these are true, and that I should just be me and ignore them. And I hope you do the same as well. He also mentions that he dresses in a more feminine fashion as a man, and I think that's fine as well. One thing I do not like about Chinese culture is how traditional and old school it can get, and it can be pretty harmful. And I also hope to see your progress in that as well. And honestly, our society as a whole is pretty old school, but we're getting there. <laughs> Before I continue, I would like to say to not fetishize feminine men as well. I said normalize men in skirts, not sexualize them. Thanks! On a lighter topic, another thing that a lot of people don't really seem to get is Asian parental love. My parents have never, uh, or not never, but have very rarely said the words I love you. <laughs> and growing up, that used to bother me so much because I would see, um, you know, like my white classmates and friends or just my non-Chinese uh, friends with their parents or I go over to their house and their parents were so verbally affectionate with them, always telling them like, I love you and I care about you. And um, even like on the phone to <laughs> uh, like always ending the conversation with like, love you. And that just never happened <laughs> with me. And so I think an American thing with me is expecting more of that uh, verbal, form of affection. Um, although I recognize, especially as I've gotten older, um, how much my parents have shown me affection and care and love through their actions, you know, through making food, through um, asking me how much I've eaten, <laughs> um, through asking, you know, about my school, supporting me um, in a lot of my endeavors and projects. Um, and so I know that they've, you know, been there for me in many ways, um, but haven't always said it. They don't give much physical affection either. I just didn't like them so much because, again, that was not something I experienced <laughs> that much from my parents. Like, I remember asking my mom to hug her one time, and it was so awkward. But it was because I was, like, leaving for a long time. Um, and, you know... I think, yeah, I think maybe it was when I was going back to China, um, you know, and like flying and all of that. Um, and so wanting to express that, that love. Um, and it was just, it's funny. Um, but yeah, there, I think they're just all different kinds of ways to express that affection. He mentions how he became weird about hugs and I'm the complete opposite in the sense that I am your clingy touch star friend that begs for hugs and will rest on your shoulder during lunch breaks, etc. It's really interesting because like as I mentioned before, I feel like Asian culture is about like being close with people. Like you're always told to like treat your strangers as your family, be nice to everyone. And then your parents are just like, no hugs. I will not touch you. I will just make you sliced fruit instead. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just that I am very cut starved now. Please give me a hug. <laughs> Even though I am cut starved and I am now a clingy cut starved friend <laughs> that is probably annoying, I still think Asian love is very strong and it's very much there. Like I kind of mentioned the sliced fruit thing yesterday. That's basically how your parents say I love you. I think most of our parents or like our ancestors sacrificed a lot for us to be here. My parents stayed in America for me so I can have a better growing up and I really appreciate that and it shows that they do love me even if they don't give me hugs. 
And I feel like Chen can relate to this as well. I was proud of this moment. Oh my god. I think probably um, when I maybe when I finished my PhD um, <laughs> because um, that was actually my dad's dream of uh, coming to this country to attain the highest degree um, in you know, his field. So he has a PhD in education. Um, and it took him 12 years to do uh, because he faced many obstacles, um, you know, around um, visas, around getting his green card. Um, you know, I don't want to say it's like an obstacle, but, you know, like raising his family. You know, I have two younger brothers. So it's like this family of five, uh, you know, while working um, and, you know, trying to do a PhD. It's a lot. So, but my mom always used to sort of joke about it, of like how long it took my dad to finish the PhD. So I think um, she was happy. I think she was like really relieved that it didn't take me <laughs> quite as long and that, you know, I can move on and do other things and not, and not be so stressed. I think that's the thing that she was happiest about. Um, that, you know, I found um, a job um, right as I was finishing the PhD, so I had more stability. Um, and yeah, she was just really glad for that because I think she, she worried a lot because I um, had to move far away to um, start the PhD. I was living in Texas. Um, you know, it was harder for us to communicate during that time so far away. Um, and so I think she... Yeah, I was also happy that I was moving um, back. Um, so my parents actually lived um, like 10 minutes away from me now <laughs> by car, although I haven't seen them very much uh, because of the, the quarantine situation. Um, but before that, like my mom would just come over um, with uh, you know, boxes of food and <laughs> fruits and uh, vegetables because um, my parents they have like a little vegetable garden um, in their backyard um, but yeah so I think she she was happy about about finishing that degree being able to come back and be like physically closer I think a lot of parents come over here for your kids to have better futures and very sweet of them well, I feel like being touched on is basically a staple in growing up Chinese American. Another staple I feel like a lot of people just don't know about is the existence of Chinese language schools, which he had growing up. Um, learning uh, Mandarin was always really important. Uh, it was emphasized in my house uh, and uh, my parents, um, when we lived in uh, university housing, this was in Amherst, Massachusetts, when my parents were graduate students at UMass Amherst. Um, they and some other, because there are all these other Chinese immigrant families um, living uh, on university housing, and they all got together and pulled resources to hire this teacher um, for their kids. So I had these after-school classes, I remember twice a week, and I remember really not loving them because <laughs> it was like more school <laughs> on top of what I was already doing um but it was also like this great way to connect with these other um kids from um Chinese families Chinese immigrant families um and so yeah twice a week we would meet in um the like laundromat <laughs> of the <laughs> Um, university housing. It was like, we just called it the laundry room. <laughs> and it was so funny because there was like this one room that um, mainly housed all these donations, um, like clothing donations. Um, but then it got turned into the, this classroom. <laughs> and eventually, like they, they even put up a chalkboard in there for us um, that the teacher could use. And she would bring back um, textbooks that were actually used by Chinese kids. Um, I don't know if it was mainland China or if it was Taiwan or somewhere else that she went to um, and would bring back these textbooks. Um, and it was like, 
maybe second grade level <laughs> Mandarin Chinese. Meanwhile, we were like sixth graders, uh, much older. Um, so we started from a more basic place. But I just remember in the background, the um, washer and dryers, <laughs> um, the like hum of them <laughs> uh, was constant in the background as we were uh, doing these lessons. I never had to go to those. I think I went to one when I was like five. I vividly remember eating a grape now and later that my teacher gave me at the Chinese school and then throwing up on the way back. And I think that was the last time I ever went to a Chinese language school. But yeah, usually my dad just teaches me and he uses really old Nguyen Shu. And speaking of my dad, he also hates the AC and so does my mom. And my parents. Basically my entire family, excluding my brother. But Chin Chin is actually the first person that I've met who continues this tradition of not really liking using the AC. This is like kind of funny because I used to really not believe in this. Um, and I don't know what it is, but I just, because I, I remember um, visiting uh, my extended family uh, and they all mostly still live in southern China in a city called Xiamen. Um, and it gets really, really hot there in the summertime. <laughs> um, and I would just blast the air conditioning. Um, and they would uh, sort of warn me against doing that, uh, you know, because they saw it as like not being good for you. Um, and it, they were like, oh, if you're hot, then you should like go take a walk by the water, um, you know, experience the natural breeze, um, like natural cooling effects instead of this machine all the time. Um, and I just sort of ignored that <laughs> when I was there. I just keep <laughs> blasting the AC because I was so hot. Um, but now I don't know whether it's because I'm older or what, um, but I don't like to keep the air conditioning on all the time. <laughs> so that's something that like oddly feels Chinese to me, um, that like I would rather not be in this like kind of artificially cooled space all the time. Um, I still drink very cold drinks, though. Um, usually not like ice cold, but I remember that was like the other thing um, that my relatives would say not to do. Um, don't drink ice water. Um, like all the beverages, including like sodas, they would like give me and they were like room temperature or like lukewarm, which I just found odd from like an American perspective. Um, but I don't know, I've come to understand some things. Admittedly, I will not be continuing this tradition of eating the AC. I just value my comfort more than my money and possibly my health. Like my parents and like my grandparents say it's like bad for you. Is that true? Like can someone tell me if that's true or not? But one thing I will continue doing is to drink hot water. I feel like China is like the only country that does this. Did you know that in China you can find like hot water, water fountains? Like I think that's really cool. I think the entire world should have that. I love hot water. It's like getting a hug to your intestines. I need a hug right now. It's really interesting to see how similar people's experience are just because they're all connected by one culture. And he actually has something to say about that. Uh, when I was in London and then in Liverpool and then in New Zealand, I was just in Wellington, the capital. Um, but in both countries, I got to meet these other um, writers of Chinese heritage, um, British Chinese poets, and also um, Chinese New Zealanders. And it was just incredible. Um, I mean, there were differences, obviously, in our experiences, but there are also so many similarities, so many things that we overlapped on. Like, I remember having this whole conversation um, with British Chinese poets about publishing um, and yeah, hurdles that we faced in publishing and, again, like assumptions about what we write about. Um, but also, um, yeah, experiences of everyday racism, 
Um, and and si similarly in, in New Zealand. Um, so it was really moving to me to be able to connect with them. Um, and also um, with identifying as um, queer in some way, as gay or lesbian or bisexual. Um, and to meet these other people who cared so much for the same art form that I do, and also shared these um, identities or experiences. Um, it's just really incredible. So I was really proud to uh, be able to do that um, through my book and the response, the amazing reception that it's received. Um, and to see that happening, yeah, not only in the United States, but in other countries. I think it's a beautiful thing that we're all connected because like even even if you like feel really alone or you're like the only Chinese kid in a really white town, someone else like a thousand miles away from you will be going through similar things and it's a great thing. You know, it also kind of scares me sometimes how similar and different we are, like we're all robots. But because we're so similar and connected it's really great to see someone writing about that. And it's really important to see someone writing about that. Like finding that poem was basically a mini awakening in me. It made me realize that I could become a poet because I've never seen Chinese American poets ever. And like imagine how great that feels for a gay person and like a Chinese American that is also queer. It's like, there's so much homophobia in the Chinese American community and just the Chinese community in general. So it's really great that Chinchin exists and he is doing this great favor for us. It makes me sad how I'll never be able to experience looking up the word tomato and then fighting self-portrait has so much potential. So yeah, in conclusion, representation is super important. What are you guys' thoughts? Hi, this is Chen Chen, and I'm reading a poem of mine that was first published in the Poetry Review, Spring 2020 issue, and it's called Spring, Summer, Autumn, Winter. I pushed my face toward the sleeping radiator. I smelled a form of justice. I wanted to be a poet. I waved my living hands dead coupons. I watched him brush his teeth. His teeth glinted gorgeous. I stumbled, cartwheeled. I said, I will always fight alongside you in the fight against tartar buildup. I said, I will. I said, thank God, without believing in thanks. I thought what my parents did, those weren't poems. I believed what white people said about my parents. I had to say, stop, stop believing them. I suckled, pickled, made mistakes about octopi, wore a blue jock strap, and took pictures, accepted stickers of astounded apples from friends. I was a wind smooching another wind who had very good teeth. I was a name everyone in America thought they were saying right. Even he thought so, then asked, is that right? I pushed my face toward the noisy radiator, its clang and labor in here. In bed, I touched his voice in his belly. I touched his good night. He said it always like it was important. It was important. I believed in the silver millennium. I said, Sailor Neptune, one day a poem for you. I said, Sailor Neptune, teach me the deep submerge, the submarine reflection, the thunderously turquoise hair. I was a name in America and would forget I belonged to my teeth. I dropped a single wish down the cavernous mailbox. He would ask, is that right? He would bring a single microwave donut on a blue napkin at dusk. He would leave me alone with my poems. Oh, if I could lick all your toes at once, I would write that poem. I loved him, I told him. I loved him, so told him about the dream. The dream starred my parents, stars of a death metal band's debut music video. They danced like everyone was watching. It was important. 
Their arms were poems. They said, so what if we misspell auditorium? So fucking what? We'll always say your name right. They pushed their faces toward me, their poems toward me. They leapt and thrashed. They were stars, stars, stars. I woke up weeping. Do you understand? I thought I could only fall asleep doing that.